Let us stop talking of this and turn to Sandoval and his captains and soldiers, who marched on victoriously in the part and streets they had captured, and when the Mexicans had defeated Cortez, they turned on Sandoval and his army and captains so effectively that he could make no headway, and they killed six soldiers and wounded all whom he had brought with him, and gave Sandoval himself three wounds, one in the thigh, another in the head, and another in the left arm. While Sandoval was battling with the enemy, they placed before him six heads of Cortez men whom they had killed, and said they were the heads of Malinche and of Tonotillo and other captains, and that they meant to do so with Sandoval and those who were with him, and they attacked him fiercely. When Sandoval saw this, he ordered all his captains and soldiers to show a brave spirit and not be dismayed, and to take care that in retreating there should not be any confusion on the causeway, which was narrow. And first of all, he ordered his allies, who were numerous, to clear off the causeway so as not to embarrass him, and with the help of his two launches and of his musketeers and crossbowmen, with great difficulty he retired to his quarters, with all his men badly wounded and even discouraged, and six of them dead. When he found himself clear of the causeway, although he was surrounded by Mexicans, he encouraged his people and their captains and charged them all to be sure to keep together in a body by day and by night, so as to guard the camp and avoid defeat. Then, when he learned from the captain, Louis Marin, that they were well able to do it, wounded and bound up in rags as he was, he took over two other horsemen with him and rode post-haste to the camp of Cortez. When Sandoval saw Cortez, he said, Oh, sir captain, what is this? Are these the councils and stratagems of warfare that you have always impressed on us? How has this disaster happened? Cortez replied, with tears springing to his eyes, O oh, my son Sandoval, for my sins this has been permitted. However, I do not deserve as much blame in the matter as all my captains and soldiers imbued. But the treasurer, Julian de Aldorete, to whom I gave the order to fill in that passage where they defeated us, and he did not do it. The treasurer in turn blamed Cortez for not ordering the many allies that he had with him to clear off the causeway in good time, and there were many other discussions and replies from Cortez to the treasurer, which, as they were spoken in anger, we left untold. At that moment there arrived two launches which Cortez kept in the lake and by the causeway, and they had not come in nor had anything been known about them since the defeat. It seems that they had been detained and impaled on some stakes, and according to what the captains reported, they had been kept there surrounded by canoes which attacked them, and they all came in wounded and said that God in the first place aided them with the wind, and thanks to the great energy with which they rode, they broke the stakes. At this, Cortez was well pleased, for up to that time, although he did not publish it so as to not to dishearten the soldiers, he knew nothing about the launches and had held them as lost. Cortez strongly advised Sandoval to proceed at once post haste to our camp of Pedro de Alvarado, and to see whether we routed, or how we stood, and if we were alive to keep us to keep up the defense, so that they should not break into our camp, and he told Francisco de Lugo, who accompanied Sandoval, for he well knew that there were Mexican squadrons on the road, that he had already sent under de Tapia with three horsemen to get news of us, and he feared that they had been killed on the road. After saying this to him and taking leave of him, he went on to embrace Sandoval and said, Look here, my son, as I am not able to go everywhere, for you can see that I am wounded. I commit this work to your care, so that you may inspire confidence in all three camps. I know well what Pedro de Alvarado and all his captains and brothers and soldiers have fought valiantly and acted like gentlemen, but I fear the great force of these dogs may have defeated him. And as for me and my army, you observe in what condition I am. Sandoval and Francisco de Lugo came post haste to where we were, and when he arrived it was a little after dusk, and it seems that the defeat of Cortez took place before noon. When Sandoval arrived, he found us fighting with the Mexicans, who wanted to get into our camp by way of some houses which we had pulled down, and others by the causeway, and many canoes by the lake, and they had already got one launch stranded on the land, and... Of the soldiers who were in it, two were dead, and most of them wounded. Sandoval saw me and six other soldiers standing more than waist high in the water, helping the launch to get off into deep water, and many Indians attacking us with swords which they had captured from us, and they gave me an arrow wound and a sword cut in the leg, so as to prevent us helping the launch, which, judging from the energy they were displaying, they intended to carry off with their canoes. They had attached many ropes to it, with which to tow it off and place it inside the city. When Sandoval saw us in that position, he said to us, 
Oh, brothers, put your strength into it and prevent them carrying off the launch. And we exerted so much strength, we soon hauled it out in safety. Though, as I have said, all of the sailors came out wounded and two dead. At that time, many companies of Mahicans came to the causeway and wounded the horsemen as well as all of us, and they gave Sandoval a good blow with a stone in the face. Then Pedro de Alvarado and other horsemen went to his assistance. As so many squadrons approached, I and twenty other soldiers faced them, and Sandoval ordered us to retreat little by little so they should not kill the horses. And because we did not retreat as quickly as he wished, he said to us with fury, do you wish that through your selfishness they should kill me and all these horsemen? For the love of me, dear brothers, do fall back. At that moment the enemy again wounded him in his horse. Just then we cleared our allies off the causeway, and we retreated little by little, keeping our faces to the enemy and not turning our backs, as though to form a dam. Notwithstanding the number of Mahicans of the balls were sweeping away, we could not fend them off. On the contrary, they kept on following us, thinking that this very night they would carry us off to be sacrificed. When we had retreated near to our quarters and had already crossed a great opening where there was much water, the arrows, javelins, and stones could no longer reach us. Sandoval, Francisco de Lugo, and Andre de Tapia were standing with Pedro de Alvarado, each one relating what had happened to him and what Cortez had ordered, when again there was surrounded the dismal drum of Huichi Lobos, and many other shells and horns and things like trumpets, and the sound of them all was terrifying, and we all looked towards the lofty queue where they were being sounded, and saw that our comrades whom they had captured by f were being carried by force up the steps, and they were taking them to be sacrificed. When they got them up to a small square in front of the oratory where their accused accursed idols were kept, we saw them place plumes on the heads of many of them, and with things like fans in their hands, they forced them to dance before Wichi Lobos, and after they had danced, they immediately placed them on their backs on some rather narrow stones which had been prepared as places for sacrifice, and with stone knives they sawed open their chests and drew out their palpitating hearts and offered them to the idols which that were there, and they kicked the bodies down the steps, and Indian butchers who were waiting below cut off the arms and feet and flayed the skin off the faces and prepared it afterwards like glove leather with all the beards on, and kept these for the festivals when they celebrated drunken orgies and the flesh they ate in Chilmule. In the same way they sacrificed all the others and ate the legs and arms and offered the hearts and blood to their idols, as I have said, and the bodies that is, to their entrails and feet, they threw to the tigers and lions which they kept in the house of the carnivores, which I have spoken about in an earlier chapter. When we saw those cruelties, all of us in our camp said the one to the other, Thank God that they are not carrying me off today to be sacrificed. It should also be noted that we were not far away from them, yet we could render them no help and could only pray God to guard us from such a death. Then, at the moment that they were making the sacrifices, great squadrons of Mahicans fell on us suddenly and gave us plenty to do on all sides, and neither in one way or the other could we prevail against them. And they cried, Look, this is the way in which you will all have to die, for our gods have promised it to us many times. Then the words and threats which they said to our friends the Flash Collins were so injurious and evil that they disheartened them and they threw them the roasted legs of Indians and arms of our soldiers and cried to them, Eat of the flesh of these Teus and of your brothers, for we are already glutted with it, and you can stuff yourself with this which is over. And observe that as for the houses which you have destroyed, we shall have to bring you to rebuild them much better with white stone and well-worked masonry. So go on helping the Teus, for you will see them all sacrificed. There was another thing that Guatemoc ordered to be done when he won that victory. He sent to all the towns of our allies and friends and to their relations the hands and feet of our soldiers and the flayed faces with the beards and the heads of the horses that they had killed. And he sent word that more than half of us were dead and he would soon finish us off. And he told them to give up their friendship with us and come to Mexico. And if they did not give it up promptly, he would come and destroy them. 
and he sent to tell them many other things to induce them to leave our camp and desert us, and then we should be killed by his hands. As they still went on attacking us both by day and by night, all of us in our camp kept watch together, Gonzalo de Sandoval and Pedro de Alvarado and the other captains keeping us company during our watch, and although during the night great companies of warriors came against us, we withstood them. Both by day and night half the horsemen remained in Tacuba, and the others half were on the causeway. There was another greater evil that they did us. No matter how carefully we had filled in the water spaces since we advanced along the causeway, they returned and opened them all and constructed barricades stronger than before. Then our friends of the cities of the lake, who had again accepted our friendship and had come to aid us with their canoes, believed that they came to gather wool and went back shorn, for many of them lost their lives and many more returned wounded, and they lost more than half of the canoes they had brought with them. But even with all this, henceforth they did not help the Mahicans, for they were hostile to them. But they carefully watched events as they happened. Let us cease talking about misfortunes, and once again tell about the caution and the manner of it that from now on we exercised, and how Gonzalo de Sandoval and Francisco de Lugo and Andre de Tapia and the other soldiers who had come to our camp thought it would be well to return to their posts and to give a report to Cortez as to how and in what position we stood. So they went post-haste and told Cortez that Pedro de Alvarado and all the soldiers were using great caution, both in fighting as well as in keeping watch. And moreover, Sandoval, as he considered me a friend, said to Cortez that he had found me and the soldiers fighting more than waist-high in water defending a stranded launch, and that if it had not been for us, the enemy would surely have killed the captain and the soldiers who were on board. And because he said other things in my praise about when he ordered me to retreat, I am not going to repeat them here, for other persons told of it, and it was known throughout the camp of Cortez and in our own, but I did not wish to recite it here. When Cortez clearly understood the great caution that we observed in our camp, it greatly eased his heart, and from that time onwards he ordered all three camps not to fight with the Mexicans, either too much or too little, meaning that we were not to trouble about capturing any bridge or barricade, and except in defense of our camps, we were not to go out to fight with the enemy. Nevertheless, the day had hardly dawned when they were attacking our camp, discharging many stones from slings and javelins and arrows, and shouting out hideous abuse, and as we had neared the camp a very broad and deep opening of water, we remained for four days in succession without crossing it. Cortez remained as long in his camp, and Sandoval and his. This determination not to go out and fight and endeavor to capture the barricades, which the Mexicans had returned to open and fortify, was because we were all badly wounded and worn out with hardships, both from keeping watch and bearing arms without anything sustaining to eat, and because we had lost the day before over sixty and odd soldiers from all the camps and eight horses, and so that we might obtain some rest and take mature counsel as to what should be done. From that time onwards, Cortez ordered us to remain quiet, as I have said, so I will leave off here and tell how and in what way we fought and everything else that happened in our camp. The Mexicans continued with their attacks every day, and our friends, the people of Tlaxcala and Cholula and Huesotzingo, and even those of Texcoco and Chalco and Tlamanalco, decided to return to their own countries, and nearly all of them went off without Cortez or Pedro de Alvarado or Sandoval even knowing about it. There only remained in Cortez's camp Ishlisholtl, who was afterwards baptized and named Don Carlos. He was the brother of Don Fernando, the Lord of Texcoco, and was a very valiant man, and about forty of his relations and friends. In Sandoval's camp there remained another cacique from Huesotzingo with about fifty men, and in our camp there remained two sons of Lorenzo de Vargas and the brave Chichimecatecla with about eighty Tlaxcalans, his relations and his vassals. When we found ourselves with so few allies, we were distressed, and Cortez and Sandoval each of them asked the allies that remained in his camp why the others had gone off in that way, and they replied that they had been observing Mexicans speaking with their idols during the night, who promised them that they should kill us, and they believed it to be true, so it was through fear that they left, and what made it more credible was seeing us all wounded and many of us dead, 
and of their own people more than twelve hundred were missing, and they feared that we should all be killed. In his conversation, which Cortez had with Ishle Shoshitl, he said to him, Signor Malinche, do not be distressed, because you cannot fight every day with the Magans. Get your foot well, and take my advice, and that is to stay some days in your camp, and tell Tonatio to do the same, and stay in his camp, and Sandoval in Tepeakia, and keep the launches on the move night and day to prevent supplies of provisions or water from getting to the enemy. For there are within this great city so many thousand jiquipeles of warriors that they must of necessity eat up the food that they possess. And the water they are now drinking is from springs they have made, and it is half salt. As it rains every day and sometimes at night, they catch the water and live on that. But what can they do if you stop their food and water? They will suffer more from hunger and thirst than from war. When Cortez understood this advice, he threw his arms around him and thanked him for it, and made him promise that he would give him pueblos. This advice many of soldiers had already discussed, but such is our nature that we did not wish to wait so long a time, but to advance into the city. When Cortez had well considered what the cacique had said, he ordered two launches to go to our camp, and to that of Sandoval, to tell us that he ordered us to remain another three days without advancing into the city. As at that time the Mexicans were victorious, he did not dare to send out one launch alone. There was one thing that helped us much, which was that our launches now ventured to break the stakes that the Mexicans had placed in the lake to impale them, and they did it in this way. They rowed with all their strength, and so that the rowing should carry greater impetus, they set about it from some distance back, and got wind into their sails and rowed their best, and so they became masters of the lake, and even of a good many houses that stood apart from the city, and when the Mexicans saw this, they lost some of their courage. As now we had no allies, we ourselves began to fill in and stop up the great opening that, as I have said before, was near our camp. And the first company on the rota worked hard at carrying adobes and timber to fill it in, while the other two companies did the fighting. And in the four days that all of us worked at it, we had it filled in and leveled. Cortez did the same in his camp, where the same arrangement prevailed, and even he himself was at work carrying adobes and timber, until the bridges and causeways and openings were secure, so that a retreat could be effected in safety. And Sandoval did neither more nor less in his camp, with our launches close by us, and free from any fear of stakes, we advanced in this manner little by little. Let me say now what the Mahicans did during the night on their great and lofty cues, and that was to sound the cursed drum, which I again declare had the most accursed sound and the most dismal that it was possible to invent, and the sound carried far over the country, and they sounded other worse instruments and diabolical things, and they made great fires and uttered the loudest yells and whistles, for at that moment they were sacrificing our comrades whom they had captured from Cortez, and we knew that it took them ten days in succession to complete the sacrificing of all of our soldiers, and they left to the last Cristobal de Guzman, whom they kept alive for twelve or thirteen days, according to the report of three Mexican captains whom we captured. Whenever they sacrificed them, then their Huichilobo spoke to them, and promised them victory, and that we should die by their hands within eight days, and told them to make vigorous attacks on us, although many should die in them, and in this way he kept them deluded. Once more, as soon as another day dawned, all the greatest forces the Guatemala could collect were already down upon us, and as we had filled up the opening and causeway of the bridge, they could pass it dry-shod. My faith, they had the daring to come up to our ranchos and hurl javelins and stones and arrows, but with the cannon we could always make them draw off, for Pedro Moreno, who had charge of the cannon, did much damage to the enemy. I wish to say that they shot our own arrows at us from our crossbows, uh, while, for while they held five crossbowmen alive and Cristobal de Guzman with them, they made them load the crossbows and show them how they were to be discharged and either they or the Mexicans discharged those shots deliberately, but they did no harm with them. Every day we had very hard fights, but we did not cease to advance, capturing barricades, bridges, and other openings. And as our launches dared to go wherever they chose in the lake, 
and did not fear the stakes. They helped us very much. Let me say that as usual, the launches that Cortez had at his camp cruised about giving chase to the canoes, bringing in supplies and water, and collecting in the lake a sort of ooze, which when it was dried had the flavor of cheese, and those launches brought in many Indian prisoners. Twelve or thirteen days had gone by since the defeat of Cortez, and as soon as Ishle Shoshil observed that we had thoroughly recovered ourselves, and what the Mexicans said that they were sure to kill us within ten days was not true, which was not what their Huichilobos and Tezcatapuca had promised them, he sent to advise his brother Don Fernando to send to Cortez at once the whole force of warriors that he could muster in Texcoco, and within two days of the time of his sending to tell him more than two thousand warriors arrived. When Cortez saw such a good reinforcement, he was greatly delighted and said flattering words to them. At that time, many Tlaxcalans with their captains also returned, and a cacique from Topeyanco named Tecapenaca came as their general. Many Indians also came from Wishotzingo, and a very few from Cholula. When Cortez knew that they had returned, he ordered them, all of them, as they arrived, to come to his camp so that he could speak to them. Before they arrived, he ordered guards of our soldiers to be placed on the roads to protect them, in case the Mexicans should come out to attack them. When they came before Cortez, he made them a speech through Doña Marina and Jaronimo de Aguila, and told them that they had fully understood and knew for certain about the goodwill with which he had always regarded them, and still bore them, both because they had served his majesty, as well as for the good offices that we had received at their hands, and if he had, after reaching the city, commanded them to join us in destroying the Mahicans, he intended them to profit by it, and return to their land rich men, and to revenge themselves on their enemies, and not that we should capture that great city solely for his benefit. And although he had always found them useful, and they had helped us in everything, they must have seen clearly that we ordered them off the causeways every day, because we were less hampered when we fought without them and that he who gave us victory and aided us in everything was our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we believe and worship, as he had already often told them and warned them at other times. Because they went away at the most critical time of the war, they were deserving of death, for deserting their captains when they were fighting and for forsaking them. But as they did not understand our laws and ordinances, he pardoned them. And in order to understand the situation better, they should observe that without their help, we still continued destroying houses and capturing barricades. From that time forward, we ordered them not to kill any Mexicans, for he wished to conquer them by kindness. When we had made this speech to them, he embraced Chichimecatecla and the two youthful Jicotengas and Ixlil and promised to give them territory and vassals in addition to what they now held. <laughs> After the conversation with them, he ordered them to depart, and each one went to his camp. From all three camps, we were now advancing into the city, Cortez on his side, Sandoval on his, and Pedro de Alvarado on our side, and we reached the spot where the spring was, that I've already spoken about, where the Mexicans drank the brackish water, and we broke it up and destroyed it so that they might not make use of it. Some Mexicans were guarding it, and we had a good skirmish with them. We could already move freely through all parts of the streets we had captured, for they were already leveled and free from water and openings, and... The horses could move very easily. Thus, the ten companies of Pedro de Alvarado advanced fighting and reached Tlatelolco, and there were so many Mexicans guarding their idols in lofty queues, and they had raised so many barricades that we were fully two hours before we were able to capture them and get inside. Now that the horses had space to gallop, although most of them were wounded, they helped us very much, and the horsemen speared many Mexicans. As the enemy were so numerous, the ten companies were divided into three parts to fight against them, and Pedro de Alvarado ordered the company commanded by a captain named Gutierrez de Badajoz to ascend the lofty queue of Huichilobos, which has 114 steps, and he fought very well against the enemy and against the many priests who were in the houses of the oratories, but the enemy attacked Gutierrez de Badajoz and his company in such a way that they sent him rolling down ten or twelve steps and we promptly went to his assistance. 
As we advanced, the squadrons with which we were fighting followed us, and we were in great risk of our lives, but nevertheless we ascended the steps, which I has, as I have said before, were 114 in number. It is as well to mention here that great danger we were in, both one company and the other, in capturing those fortresses which were very lofty, and in those battles they once more wounded us all very badly. Nevertheless, we set those oratories on fire and burned the idols, and we planted our banners and were fighting on the level after we had set fire to the oratories until night time. But we could do nothing against so many warriors. Extract from the third letter of Cortez to the Emperor Charles V. About 15th July. By now the Spaniards who had been wounded at the time of our defeat had recovered. Moreover, a vessel belonging to Ponce de Leon arrived at Veracruz, and the people of the town sent me some powder and crossbows, of which we had great need. The people of the surrounding country had, thank God, now declared in our favor, and I, seeing how those of the city were still hostile and showing as clearly as any people could a determination to die in its defense, was at a loss to know how to free ourselves from the dangers and hardships we were enduring without totally destroying the city, for it is the most beautiful city in the world. It was useless to tell them that we would not raise the siege, and that the launches would not cease to fight them on the water, nor that we had already destroyed the people of Matalcingo or Malinalco, and that there was no one left in the land to bring them succor, and that there was nowhere whence they could procure maize, meat, fruit, water, or other necessaries, for the more we repeated this to them, the less faint-heartedness they showed. On the contrary, both in fighting and in stratagems, we found them more undaunted than ever. This being so, and seeing that the siege had lasted already more than forty-five days, we decided to take other means for our security and for the reduction of the enemy. The plan was to demolish every house on each side of the street as we penetrated into the city, and not to advance a step until all was leveled to the ground, and what had been water was dry land, no matter what delay this would entail. For this purpose, I called together all the chieftains and leading men among our allies, and explained my plan to them, and told them to summon all their laborers and order them to bring their coas, which are like Spanish holes. They replied that they would do so very willingly, and were delighted at the plan, for it seemed to them the best way of destroying the city, which they desired above all things in the world. Three or four days were occupied making arrangements, and one morning after hearing mass we set out for the city, and on reaching the water opening and barricade near the great houses of the plaza, with the intention to attack it, the people of the city asked to desist, as they wished to make peace that a chieftain from the city was coming to speak to me. In this way they detained me for more than an hour, but in truth they had no desire for peace, for while they were standing at ease, they began to shoot arrows and darts and stones at us. When I saw this, we attacked and carried the barricade. On entering the plaza, we found it all strewn with great stones, and the horsemen could not gallop, and we found one street barricaded with a dry stone wall, and another street also full of stones, and this day we filled in the canal which goes out of the plaza in such a way that the Indians were never able to open it again. And from this point onwards began little by little to demolish the houses and to fill in the canals. And as on that day we had 150,000 warriors with us, we accomplished a good deal. In this way we penetrated into the city during the following five or six days. And always on retiring we sent off our allies first, while some of the Spaniards stayed in ambush along the houses, and the horsemen who were in the rear pretended to retreat hastily, so as to draw the enemy out into the plaza, and by this means, and with the foot soldiers in ambush, we managed to spear some of the enemy every afternoon. We knew that the Indians in the city were much discouraged, and we heard from two wretched Indians who had left the city by night and come to our camp that the people were dying of hunger, and that they came out by night to search among the houses and in those parts of the city we had already captured, seeking for firewood and herbs and roots and food. As we had already filled in many of the canals and made good many of the bad places, I decided to enter the city before dawn and do all the damage we were able to the launches set out before daybreak and I with twelve or fifteen horsemen, 
and some foot soldiers and allies entered with a rush. But first of all, whilst we were in hiding, we stationed some spies who, as soon as day dawned, gave us a signal to advance, and we fell on a great multitude of people. But as they were the poor wretches who had come out hunting for food, they were most of them unarmed, and were women and children, and we did so much damage to them whenever we could get out about the city that prisoners and dead between them numbered over 800. The launches also captured many canoes with Indians who were out fishing, and the captains and chieftains of the enemy saw us advancing to the city as this unusual hour they were dismayed and did not dare to come out to fight us. So we returned to our camp with booty and food for our allies. The next day we again secured the city as our allies observed the elderly method with which we were carrying out its destruction. They accompanied us every day in untold numbers. That day we succeeded in gaining the whole of the Tacuba Street and filling in the bad places in such a way that we could communicate with the camp of Pedro de Alvarado through the city. And we also captured two bridges on the principal street leading to the marketplace and solidly filled in the canals. We also set fire to the houses of the lord of the city, a youth of eighteen years named Guatemoc, who was the second lord after the death of Montezuma. These houses were large and well fortified and were surrounded by water. We also gained two bridges near this on the other streets, leading to the marketplace, so that three quarters of the city were already in our hands, and our Indians were forced to retire to their stronghold, which was among the houses more completely surrounded by water. 25th July. The next day, which was the festival of the Apostle Santiago, St. James, we entered the city in the same order and followed the great street which leads to the marketplace and captured a very large water opening which the enemy thought they held securely. It was a very dangerous operation and caused much delay as the opening was so wide, and we were not able that day to fill it in solidly so that the horsemen could pass. Observing this, the Indian reinforcements, splendid in appearance, attacked us, but as we continued to face them and had with us many crossbowmen, we drove them back to their barricades. 26 July when we returned very early next morning, we found the water opening we had been filling up in the same state as we had left it, and advancing two bow shots ahead, we captured two great water openings, which the enemy had broken through the roadbed, and we reached a small idle tower, where we found the heads of some of the Christians whom the enemy had killed, which caused us great grief. This street which we had been following leads directly to the causeway to Sandoval's camp, and a street to the left leads to the marketplace. In this latter street there was no water except one water opening which the enemy were defending against us, and on that day, when we were getting ready to enter the city at nine in the morning, we observed from our camp that smoke was ascending from the two lofty towers which stood in Tlalte Local, the marketplace of the city, and could not think what it could be, for it was more copious than the smoke of incense which the Indians offered to the idols, and we concluded that Pedro de Alvarado's men must have got there which turned out to be the fact, although we could hardly believe it. That day we did not attempt to capture the bridge and the canal which separated us from the marketplace, but contended ourselves by filling in and leveling all the bad places. On the retiring, the enemy attacked us fiercely, although at great cost to themselves. The next morning we had only to capture the canal across the road and its barricade which was near the idle tower to reach the marketplace. When we began the attack, a standard bearer and two or three other Spaniards threw themselves into the water, and the enemy gave way before them, and we began to fill in the opening so that the horsemen could cross, and while this was being done, Pedro de Alvarado, with four horsemen, came along the street, and this gave the greatest delight to all of us, for it meant the speedy end of the war. Pedro de Alvarado placed guards to defend our flanks, and as the opening was soon filled, I ordered my troops not to advance any further, and went forward myself with a few horsemen to see the marketplace. We rode for a short time about the plaza, observing the arcades where the enemy were clustered in great numbers on the roofs, but as they saw us riding freely about the great plaza, they did not dare to approach us. Then I ascended the great tower, which is near the marketplace, and on it and on others we found the heads of the Christians they had killed and offered to their idols, as well as the heads of our Tlaxcalan allies. From the great tower I could see that we had captured seven-eighths of the city, and knew that the enemy were so numerous that they could not exist in that narrow space, especially in the houses left to them. 
They were too small, and each one stood by itself in the water. And above all, knowing of the great hunger they were suffering, for they had found in the streets gnawed roots and bark of trees, we determined to cease fighting for a day, and derive some means to save such a multitude from destruction. However, they said they would never make peace, and that if only one was left, he would die fighting. <clears throat> Several days passed without fighting, and then one day when we returned to the city, we found the streets full of women and children, and other miserable people, thin and afflicted, who were dying of hunger, the most pitiable thing in the world to see, and I ordered our allies to do them no hurt. But not a single warrior appeared where he could be got at, although we saw them on the roofs, covered with their cloaks and unarmed. Again I tried this day to bring them to peace, but their replies were evasive. After passing most of the day in these efforts, I sent to tell them I should attack them, that they must call in all their people. Otherwise, I should allow our allies to kill them. They still said they wanted peace. So I replied that I did not see there the Lord with whom I could treat for peace, and that if he would come, I would give him all the security he might ask for, and that we would discuss peace. However, when we saw that it was all a mock, and that they were all getting ready to attack us after having warned them many times so as to constrain them to the utmost necessity, I ordered Pedro de Alvarado and all his men to enter the large quarter which the enemy still held, which consisted of more than a thousand houses, while I entered with all my men from the other side on foot, as the horsemen were useless there. The battle was waged fiercely until we captured the whole of the quarter, and the slaughter effected by our allies was so great that dead and prisoners numbered more than twelve thousand souls, and the cruelty of our allies was so great that on no account would they spare a life in spite of our proofs and example. To return to Bernard Diaz. As we were all of us now in Tlota Loco, Cortez ordered all the companies to take up their quarters and keep watch there, because from our camp we had to come more than half a league to where we were now fighting. So we stayed there three days without doing anything worth mentioning, because Cortez ordered us not to advance any further to the city, nor to destroy more houses, for we wished to stop and demand peace. During those days that we were waiting in Tlota local, Cortez sent to Guatemoc begging him to surrender, and not to have any fear, and with many promises he undertook that his, Guatemoc's person, should be much respected and honored by him, and that he should govern Mexico and all his territory and cities as he was used to do, and he sent him food and presents such as tortillas, poultry, tunas, and cacao, for he had nothing else to send. Guatemoc took counsel with his captains, and what they advised him to reply was that he desired peace, but that he would wait three days before giving an answer, and that at the end of three days Guatemoc and Cortez should meet and make arrangements about the peace, and that during those three days they would have time to know more fully the wishes and reply of their huichilopos, and he might have added to mend bridges, and to make openings in the causeway, and prepare arrows, javelins, and stones, and make barricades. Guatemoc sent four Mexican chieftains with that reply, and we believed that the promise of peace was true, and Cortez ordered the messengers to be given plenty to eat and drink, and then sent them back to Guatemoc. And with them he sent more refreshments, the same as before. Then Guatemoc sent other messengers, and by them two rich mantles, and they said that Guatemoc would come when everything was ready. Not to waste more words about the matter, he never intended to come, for they had counseled him not to believe Cortez, and it reminded him of the end of his uncle, the great Montezuma, and of his relations and the destruction of all the noble families of Mexico, and had advised him to say that he was ill, but intended that all should sally out to fight, and that it would please their gods to give them the victory they had so often promised them. As we were waiting for Guatemoc, and he did not come, we understood the deceit, and at that very moment... So many battalions of Mexicans with the distinguishing marks sallied out and made an attack on Cortez that he could not withstand it, and as many more went in the direction of our camp and in that of Sandoval's. They came on in such a way that it seemed so though they had just then begun the fighting all over again, and as we were posted rather carelessly, believing that they had already made peace, they wounded many of our soldiers, three of them very severely, and two horses, but they did not get off with much to brag of, for we paid them out well. 
When Cortez saw this, he ordered us to again make war on them and to advance into the city in the part where they had taken refuge. When they saw that we were advancing and capturing the whole city, Guatemoc sent two chiefs to tell Cortez that he desired to speak with him across a canal, Cortez to stand on one bank and Guatemoc on the other, and they fixed the time for the morning of the following day. Cortez went, but Guatemoc would not keep the appointment, but sent chieftains who said that the Lord did not dare to come out for fear, lest while they were talking guns and crossbows should be discharged at him and should kill him. Then Cortez promised him on his oath that he should not be molested in any way that he did not approve of, but it was no use. They did not believe him, and said, lest what happened to Montezuma should happen to him. At that time, two of the chieftains who were talking to Cortez drew out from a bag which they carried some tortillas and the leg of a fowl and cherries, and seated themselves in a very leisurely manner and began to eat so that Cortez might observe it and believe that they were not hungry. When Cortez observed it, he sent to tell them that as they did not wish to make peace, he would soon enter into all their houses and see if they had any maize and how much more poultry. We went on in this way for another four or five days without attacking them, and about this time many poor Indians who had nothing to eat would come out every night, and they came to our camp worn out by hunger. As soon as Cortez saw this, he ordered us not to attack them, for perhaps they would change their minds about making peace. But they would not make peace, although we sent to entreat them. In Cortez's camp there was a soldier who said that he had been in Italy in the company of the great captain, Backing up very briefly. In Cortez's camp, there was a soldier who said that he had been in Italy in the company of the great captain and was in the skirmish of Garayano and in other great battles. And he talked about engines of war very much, and that he could make a catapult in local by which, if they only bombarded the houses and part of the city where Guatemoc had sought refuge for two days, they would make them surrender peacefully. So many things did he say to Cortez about this, for he was a very faithful soldier, that Cortez promptly set to work to make the catapult, and they brought lime and stone in the way the soldier required, and carpenters and nails and all that was necessary for making the catapult, and they made two slings of strong bags and cords, and brought him great stones larger than an aroba jar. When the catapult was made and set up in the way that the soldier ordered, and he said it was ready to be discharged, they placed a suitable stone in the sling which had been made, and all this stone did was to rise no higher than the catapult and fall back upon where it had been set up. When Cortez saw this, he was angry with the soldier who gave the order for making it, and with himself for believing him, and he said that he knew well that in war one ought not to speak much about a thing that vexes one, that the man had only been talking for talking's sake, as had been found out in the way that I have said. Cortez at once ordered the catapult to be taken to pieces. Let us leave this and say that when he saw that the catapult was a thing to be laughed at, he decided that Gonzalo de Sandoval should go in command of all the twelve launches and invade that part of the city whither Guatemoc had retreated, which was in a part which we could not reach the houses and palaces by land, but only by water. Sandoval at once summoned all the captains of the launches and invaded that part of the city where Guatemoc had taken refuge with all the flower of his captains and the most distinguished persons that were in Mexico. Cortez ordered Sandoval not to kill or wound any Indians unless they should attack him, and even if they did attack him, he was only to defend himself and not do them any other harm. But he should destroy their houses and the many defenses they'd erect in the lake. Cortez himself has ended the great queue of Tlalte local to see how Sandoval advanced with the launches. Sandoval advanced with great ardor upon the place where the houses of Guatemoc stood, and when Guatemoc saw himself surrounded, he was afraid that they would capture him or kill him, and he had got ready fifty great piraguas with good rowers, so that when he saw himself hard-pressed, he could save himself by going to hide in some reed beds and get from thence to land and hide himself in another town. And those were the instructions he had given his captains and the persons of importance who were with him in that fortified part of the city, so that they should do the same. When they saw that the launches were getting among the houses, they embarked in the fifty canoes, and they had already placed on board the property and gold and jewels of Guatemoc and all his family and women, and he had embarked himself 
and shot out into the lake ahead, accompanied by many captains. As many other canoes set out at the same time, the lake was full of them, and Sandoval quickly received the news that Guatemoc was fleeing, and ordered all the launches to stop destroying the houses and fortifications, and follow the flight of the canoes. As a certain Garcia Hurguin, a friend of Sandoval, was captain of a launch which was very fast and a good sailor, and was manned by good rowers, Sandoval ordered him to follow in the direction in which they told him that Guatemoc was fleeing with his great piraguas, and instructed him not to do Guatemoc any injury whatever beyond capturing him, in case he should overtake him, and Sandoval went in another direction with other launches which kept him company. It pleased the Lord God that Garcia Holguin should overtake the canoes in Paraguas in which Guatemoc was traveling, and from the style and awnings and the seat he was using, he knew that it was Guatemoc, the great Lord of Mexico, and he made signals for them to stop. But they would not stop, so he made as though he were going to discharge muskets and crossbows. When Guatemoc saw that, he was afraid and said, Do not shoot. I am the king of this city, and they call me Guatemoc, and what I ask of you is not to disturb my things that I am taking with me, nor my wife, nor my relations, but carry me at once to Malinche. When Holguin heard him, he was greatly delighted, and with much respect he embraced him and placed him in the launch, him and his wife and about thirty chieftains, and seated him in the poop on some mats and cloths, and gave him to eat of the food that he had brought with him, and he touched nothing whatever in the canoes that carried Wazimok's property but brought it along with the launch. By this time, Gonzalo de Sandoval knew that Holguin had captured Guatemoc and was carrying him to Cortez, and he overtook Holguin and claimed the prisoner, and Holguin would not give him up and said that he had captured him and not Sandoval. When Cortez knew of this dispute, he at once dispatched Captain Louis Marin and Francisco de Verdugo to summon Sandoval and Holguin to come as they were in the launches without further discussion and to bring Guatemoc and his wife and family with all signs of respect, and that he would settle whose prisoner he was, and to whom was due the honor of the capture. While they were bringing him, Cortez ordered a guest cham chamber to be prepared, as well as could be done at the time, with mats and clothes and seats, and a good supply of the food which Cortez had reserved for himself. Sandoval and Holguin soon arrived with Guatemoc, and the two captains between them led him up to Cortez. And when he came in front of him, he paid him great respect, and Cortez embraced Guatemoc with delight, and was very affectionate to him and his captains. Then Guatemoc said to Cortez, Signor Malinche, I have surely done my duty in defense of my city, and I can do no more, and I come by force and a prisoner into your presence, and into your power. Take that dagger that you have in your belt and kill me at once with it. And when he had said this, he wept tears and sobbed, and other great lords whom he had brought with him also wept. Cortez answered him through Doña Marina and Aguilar very affectionately, that he esteemed him all the more for having been so brave as to defend the city. And he was deserving of no blame. On the contrary, it was more in his favor than otherwise. What he wished was that Guatemoc had made peace of his own free will before the city had been so far destroyed and so many of his Mexicans had died. But now that both had happened, there was no help for it, and it could not be mended. Let his spirit and the spirit of his captains take rest, and he should rule in Mexico and over his provinces as he did before. Then Guatemoc and his captains said that they accepted his favor, and Cortez asked after his wife and other great ladies, the wives of other captains who, he had been told, had come with Guatemoc. Guatemoc himself answered and said that he had begged Gonzalo de Sandoval and Garcia Holguin that they might remain in the canoes while he came to see what orders Malinche gave them. Cortez at once sent for them and ordered them all to be given of the best that at that time there was in the camp to eat. And as it was late and was beginning to rain, Cortez arranged for them to go to Coyoacan and took Guatemoc and all his family and household and many chieftains with him. And he ordered Pedro de Alvarado, Gonzalo de Sandoval, and the other captains, each to go to his own quarters in camp. And we went to Tucuba, Sandoval to Tepeyaquia, and Cortez to Coyoacan. Guatemoc and his captains were captured on the 13th day of August, at the time of Vespers on the day of Senor San Hipólito, in the year 1521. Thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ, and our Lady the Virgin Santa Maria, his Blessed Mother. Amen.
the end of chapter 11, the siege and fall of Mexico, and the end of the discovery and conquest of Mexico.